Uh, sometimes if we forgot we ask, Don has not forgotten that we asked. And so he's been really good at bringing things back so that we can make better decisions or better follow-up questions or answers. So that's, for, from my standpoint, that is super helpful. And that's what, what I would most rely on you for is that kind of information. Thank you, Troy. Derek. Well, Troy uh, essentially stole my thunder. Everything <laughs> he said was essentially what I just written down. Uh, trying to get information, time constraints. Uh, it really helps to receive that and have that uh, not only transparency, but just uh, the information flow really helps. Um, and information and in, in how the other stakeholders in these different um you know uh things that we have come up also is a big help that i like to see also so but yeah follow don's footsteps he's good okay and i'm gonna call on sean but kendall i want to make clear sean is our elder statesman even though he's much younger than i am <laughs> he has spent the most time on PRAC, and if you need to know what PRAC has done or decided in the past, Sean's the source. Sean, can you answer Kendall's question? Sure. I, I think the, um, the biggest thing for me is to help advocate for PRAC. And, and what I mean by that is we're all here volunteering our time because we believe in PRAC and the system. And so if PRAC is not included in decisions uh, that other city uh, committees or departments are dealing with, um, it, it's good for us to be involved in those. So for example, um, I frankly don't watch every city commission meeting like a couple others do. And uh, so I may miss certain important discussions that may be park related. And so if those don't make it back to a PRAC meeting for us to help weigh in on, uh, then we all miss out. And then our volunteer time has been wasted. And so I think all, all staff members in your department um, can help advocate for PRAC. And uh, you know, we've, we've got a long road ahead of us with the budget shortfall, with the, the um, list of deferred maintenance items. You've got a, you've got a tough job ahead of you. And, Everybody on my screen, we're your biggest fans right now, and we're huge advocates, and uh, we'll help you get there. And uh, it's not going to be an easy job. So, I, I think that's other than Troy's transparency. That was literally the first words out of my mouth. So, <laughs> <laughs> thank you, Sean. Andy. Well, yeah, both Sean now Troy take, taking my thunder, but uh, I was actually going to talk specifically the biggest. I, I'm not a, a guy who has a great words of wisdom, but I think the, the challenges, I'll echo what Sean said, of uh, deferred maintenance versus new projects. You know, we have a huge, huge deferred maintenance. Uh, at some point, we need to figure out how to check those boxes off or get some of those projects. Uh, thinking of all, all of us being at home during COVID projects, get, I'm getting a lot of projects done. Um, maybe these are the times that we need to uh, work on some of those. Balance that with new projects. All right, Doug. Uh, I guess one of the things that uh, I might uh, I might suggest would be uh, for Mr. Reed to look at the goals that we set at the beginning of the year to show where our interests are. And then there are a couple of other things. Uh, it's been more than two years since we've had a joint, uh, I believe it's more than two years since we've had a joint meeting with the city commission in which we were talking about our, uh, our the, our, the fact that we're so badly un, uh, underfunded. And th there was a presentation made in terms of how much we were underfunded. And I think most of us were floored when we heard that at that joint meeting, because although we knew we were underfunded, we didn't see the listed items that were there and the cost of those. And I think, I think at one point those need to come back to us and uh, it'd be nice within this year, but I think maybe problematically it, it might be next year uh, when we would want to revisit those items with the city commission. 
the other thing is I don't I don't watch all the city commission meetings, but I do look at the agenda. And when I see things, I'm also in the Natural Resource Committee. When I see things come up there, I usually follow them. And there have been cases where the city commission has taken some, some action on something that involved parks and recreation, and it never came to us. Now, I believe you will end up, um, uh, Mr. Reed, I think you will end up attending all those commission meetings. And I think if you see somebody trying to push something to an action item at the co city commission level that hasn't come to us, that you almost need to speak up. I'm not talking about Don's period, but in, in the previous director, we had some things that never came to us. And I think that's because he didn't say, you know, that's an item the PIAC should look at. And that's one thing I'd like to see. Thank you, Doug. Brent. Hey, Kendall. I'm going to kind of tie into Doug's um, statement <laughs> and as well as Troy and, and, and Andy's and everybody else's is number one, transparency and communication and what you hear. But additionally, I'd like to see how we can expand the Parks and Recreation Department in Oregon City and how it can better serve the community. All right, Alicia. Well, I'd like to see the message get across um, to um, the council, the, to the commission, um, really quantitatively how understaffed and underfunded the department is and really break that down because you have a small and mighty staff who are who work so hard and have been with the department for so long and um, need appreciation and need love and it really seems as if um, it's um, the department may be misunderstood in terms of how much they do and when you look at <laughs> what the staff responsibilities are and the um, kind of the depth and breadth compared to other departments, whether small or large. Um, some of your staff are doing like three jobs um, that other departments would be doing. So um, really pushing that forward because oftentimes Parks and Recreation is so underfunded and it's so misunderstood and it's really, you know, people just think it's fun and games um, instead of the deeper, broader societal aspect of it. So um, for me, I think that's huge. Um, I agree it would be great to see Oregon City Parks and Recreation grow because the community has grown tremendously even in the 15 years um, that we've lived here as a family. But fundamentally, to do so, the foundation needs to be stronger, it needs to be better funded, better staffed, and the existing parks and programs need support before you grow anymore, um, because it's the, the department's tapped out. Um, and I think there's a lot of no, words of no in your future. Um, so good luck. You got a great job. <laughs> All right, Jeff. Well, I would, uh, I would put budget and funding at the top of my, my comment list because uh, it's obvious that uh, many areas uh, we're having budget constraints with uh, uh, some of our deferred maintenance and funding issues. But two things that I might add to the discussion that we've had here is it seems like last year we had an awful lot of vandalism. Um, and it's... It, it, when I was in Peoria, we had vandalism too, but I don't think it's, um, even though Peoria is about five times the size of, of Oregon City, I, I think the vandalism issue in Oregon City was much greater than it was in Peoria. So I'm a little concerned about that, and I don't know how we can get on top of that, but I think it, it creates a situation where a lot of your staff is spending time just fixing things that are uh, destroyed, broken, or painted over, or what have you. So uh, that's one uh, very serious issue I think we need to address. And the other one is, uh, and again, I'm, uh, it's not fair, perhaps, but I'm comparing Peoria with uh, Oregon City. Um, we had a lot of citizen involvement in our uh, meetings in Peoria. And I'm a little surprised uh, the year that I've spent on the PRAC here. Uh, the very few numbers of people that show up, uh, that doesn't 
mean I don't think that people aren't interested in parks. I think they're just not aware that they have an opportunity for a voice. And so I'd like to see uh, some effort made towards uh, encouraging more citizen involvement in, in our meetings. And uh, that's what I have to say. Thank you. Okay, Madam Chair is gonna weigh in here. I We dealt in two city work sessions with two issues, staffing and deferred maintenance. I have no faith in the figures we were provided for deferred maintenance. Some of those figures were aging structures, not necessarily something that was deferred. And from working with staff, uh, we are severely understaffed. And in both work sessions, we were asked to, or actually, the director was asked to come back with comps for other regional parks. So how many acres do you have? What are you maintaining? How many people do you employ? That information was never provided. We need those comps for the city commission because at this point, staff comes out of general fund, it can come out of other sources. And that was what we discussed in both of the work sessions. Um, deferred maintenance and, oh my goodness, it just wore out, are two different things and really need legitimate figures. If you need to replace a sign what is the actual cost to replace that sign? Not, I came up with a number to replace that sign. And that has been one of my big frustrations up till now, and Don's aware of it. <laughs> so those are my primaries. We, we have aging structures, we have deferred maintenance, and I will say the cemetery is it greatly in need of cleaning on the mausoleums that hasn't come to the top of the list, but it's a huge issue. And we are severely understaffed, but we have to be able to show that comparably for the amount of space we're maintaining, what everybody else is employing to do that. So I will close this one. And Don, I have a question. Don. <laughs> Oops, I lost Don again. <laughs> no, I'm oh, back. I'm back. Okay. Sorry about that. I was unmuted and, and trying to find the mute button. I, uh, <laughs> what was that question again? Have that same problem. All right. We're under general business. We've introduced Kendall and introduced ourselves. Okay. What I see on the agenda is discussion of upcoming issues. Is this where we discuss water board? Yeah, I'd like to, if, if, if I may, I'd like to kind Please. of wade in on this a little tiny bit for you. Um, upcoming issues is kind of a, a bit of a catch-all, I realize that. And there are several things I want to kind of touch bases on. And probably the most significant one of those is, is water board park. But before we do that, I want to kind of revisit a few of the things that I've heard you guys talking about um, over the past uh, number of minutes here. But I just want to kind of give you a, a quick update and a little perspective, if I could, on the what I refer to as our deferred projects list, not deferred maintenance list. Um, the, the one thing that I want to share with you is the, the deferred projects list, and I'm looking at it right now as I, I have it on my screen, uh, is broken into two pieces. The two pieces are, for one, the first piece is for facilities. Of those facilities, you take a look at it, you will see that uh, there is an, a small number of projects over at the Pioneer Community Center and a small number of, at the pool itself. Um, but the vast majority of that list deals with the structural issues associated with the end of the Oregon Trail. And of all the projects on that list, uh, basically over $3 million of, of that list um, is at the end of the Oregon Trail. So I guess for an upcoming issue, one of the things that I, I am glad to hear is you guys wanting to discuss uh, the deferred projects list. And I would 
strongly suggest that you take a look at that section. And I believe at some point the city's gonna have to make a decision about what they wanna do or don't do with the end of the Oregon Trail buildings themselves. I know it's operated by a, a third party provider and I know that uh, there are a number of needs there. I recall when it was being built, I knew the fellow that managed the construction project there and, and uh, basically what he told me was that the canvas tops that used to be on them were part of the roof system. And without those canvas tops, the roof would fail, water would get into the building, and, and I think we've seen that. And I think Denise um, can probably vouch for how much issues we have associated with, with that. And I'm having a hard time getting my next screen that I'm looking for. The other part of, of the list um, that has been discussed on the deferred projects list is for parks themselves, just the outdoor facilities, everything that we operate. Um, that list was listed at 20, oh, in excess of $23 million um, nine months ago. Uh, today, after you go through that list quickly and, and take a quick look at everything that has been accomplished um, in the last nine months or so, um, you will discover that when you start pulling those accomplishments out or projects that are in the process of being accomplished. So when you take a look at the Chapin Park restroom replacement, or you take a look at the, the uh, replacement of the playgrounds at uh, Park Place Park, or you take a look at the sidewalks that were repaired over at, at the pool and some of the other places um, around town through both replacement or grinding down to get those down to a, a usable level. If you take a look at uh, the, the monies associated with the recently led bid, the, the moving forward of the DC Lottery at Park, suddenly that balance goes from 23 million down to $20 million. So that's an improvement of about $3 million in the past number of months, um, or you know, a significant percentage of, of what is go going on there. So I, I would caution you to remember every single department, whether it's Oregon City, or Portland or Lama Lane or the National Park Service will show a significant amount of deferred projects or deferred maintenance. It's not whether you have them, it's how you, you look at them and, and how you utilize those lists. And I think that in, in some ways, this list was used as much to beat the uh, department about the head and shoulders as it was to motivate or to find solutions. I think it's, it's time and with Kendall's direction, um, hopefully we can move towards finding the solutions to this list as opposed to just beating up about the list. So with that, I'll leave that topic. I do wanna point out that uh, also on that list is Waterboard Park. And if you took a look at Waterboard Park from that list, uh, you will find that it identifies $1,142,000 in improvements needed at Waterboard Park. And of course, the most significant amount of that is the, the walking trail at a million dollars. So how does this relate to the upper yard discussion that, that uh, really what we're kind of having here? Well, you know, and, and some of you came out and visited with me, we walked the site out there and we took a look at it. And I, I think I told a few of you there's, there's kind of two arguments with it. On one hand, there's the argument of, we don't make land anymore. Whoever was in charge of manufacturing land has quit making it, and so we have a finite amount of land. And whenever we get the opportunity to acquire land, we should take a serious look at acquiring that property. On the flip side of that argument is, we have a lot of deferred maintenance within that park, and we have a lot of deferred projects within all of our parks, and not all of our parks are developed, so why would we wanna consider taking on more potential liability um, as opposed to maintaining those parks. I think two years ago, you guys had a conversation and you had a vote. I believe that the tally was five to four and uh, the, the vote came down in favor of recommending approval of incorporating the upper yard into Waterboard Park um, and making it a charter park as that occurs. Uh, what strikes me is, is maybe one of the things you might wanna consider is moving is having that discussion about, is that the appropriate decision, making it a charter park, or is it something that could be leveraged for additional revenues that's somewhere down the point that would help reduce some of the overhead associated with our deferred maintenance list. 
So with that, I'm gonna be quiet. I'd be happy to respond to any questions and I will defer to Kendall to have first grabs at any questions and, uh, and then I will certainly chime in as needed. Actually, Mad Madam Chair will join. Um, if you have a comment and what Don just had to say, please raise your hand. But we will start with Kendall. So I did have a conversation uh, with Tony uh, about uh, Waterford Park. Uh, and he did share with me that there's some information that he's going to share with me so I can share with all of you about some of the things that, that, that have been done, uh, some of the steps that have been taken. It's somewhat of a tedious process, uh, but I will be getting that, that information and sharing that with, with all of you uh, at the next meeting. Uh, but I just wanted you to be aware of that. Okay, Brent has a hand up. Don, can you remind me what a charter park is and the pros and cons of a charter park? Sure. Uh, charter parks are unique to Oregon City uh, within the city's charter. And the city's charter is basically the rule book of how the city operates, right? It establishes everything from terms of commissioners to um, how we set fees. It talks about Basically, it's our bylaws and how the, the city functions. One of the, um, and every city's charter is a little bit different. And so, you know, Oregon City, of course, has its own unique spins. And one of those unique spins is the concept of charter parks. And that was put into place to ensure the citizens are protected or the parks are protected on behalf of the citizens from reuse of that land or rededications of that land. And basically, what a, a designation of a charter park says is that the park that is dedicated will only be used for parks and recreation purposes or maintenance of park and recreation purposes. So it, with, to go around that, there isn't an, an out on that. It, that would require a vote of all the citizens of, of you know, the community. So you, know, you put it out on ballot and they would have the opportunity to override that. The, while that sounds uh, wonderful, and it is wonderful, it's a great feature, um, there are certain unintended consequences sometimes um, with everything else too. And those unintended consequences include a, a kind of a handcuffing, if you will, of flexibility and, and able to move. Right now, all parts within the city limits, with the exception of, I think, three or four are charter parks. One of those that is not a charter park is uh, referenced as Dement Park. It's about a size of a, of a city lot. And there has been some discussion over the years of maybe you want to sell that and utilize the money for something else. Another one that's not a charter park is uh, Sportcraft Marine. The reason why Sportcraft Marine is not a charter park is because it has an existing lease on it. Uh, we have a leaseholder that operates the marina down there. And if we had a charter park, we wouldn't be able to allow that unless we went back out for a vote of the people. Every time you do a vote of the people, you're looking at $20,000 or $30,000. So they're not to be taken lightly. Uh, another area that is a charter that is not a charter park is the promenade, the McLaughlin promenade. And the reason why that's not a charter park, as I understand it, is that there's a number of encroachments on there. Um, old surveys, new surveys have identified everything from driveways to front porches to roof lines, um, posts that have hold up houses, a little tiny bit of somebody's living room, all encroaching on the park. And so that wouldn't qualify as a charter park. One of the concerns that I've had about charter parks from citizens uh, is a great example of Wesley Lynn. My understanding was when Icon wanted to do the development out of Wesley Lynn, uh, there was some concerns, got put on the ballot, should they be allowed to do the development or should they be given the right of ways to do the development for access or for uh, utility easements. The citizens actually said no. Um, the city went back and said, are you sure? The citizens said, yep, no, we don't want to do it. And yet, because of the existing easements, the city had to allow them to do it. And so there's a number of people in the community that are saying, hey, wait a minute, that's a foul. You know, we said no, and now it's going forward on a technicality. It happens to be, in my opinion, a, a good technicality and a legitimate technicality, but, you know, one that has created a, an amount of confusion within the community. So that, in a nutshell, is a charter park. 
Thank you, Doug. Okay, Ali Alicia? <coughs> Um, quick question. <laughs> yes, a quick question is um, doing the tour with Don a couple weeks ago in terms of the hillside and the erosion and the liability. So if that became, um, if the upper yard became um, a charter park and, you know, fell within the jurisdiction of the Parks Department for Oregon City, then would any, you know, any slides, any damage like um, that happens on that property, would those costs come <laughs> out of the parks department budget? Because um, obviously with water, bar water board park, there's a lot going on in the park itself. And then right. you look at the upper yard and it's like, oh my gosh, this is the future. So if the property continues just to stay within the hands of the city itself, then is the city general fund as a whole, you know, um, responsible for that and not the department? Well, um, let me take a crack at that and it probably won't be a, a, as complete an answer or as simple of an answer as maybe you're hoping for. And the answer is yes and yes, and no and no. So yes, the city would remain liable for it. It's under city ownership. It would continue to be under city ownership. It would just be designated as a charter park. And that's to be looked at as a housekeeping process that puts restrictions on it. Um, it would be funded through the cost center of parks, but parks are also funded through the general fund. So any liability costs associated with that would come out of the general fund of which we're a part of. Now the, the commission and the budget committee, which is half commissioners, half citizens appointed, uh, would have the uh, prerogative of saying, well, it, you know, we have this liability, we had a, a situation that's gonna cost uh, X amount of dollars. And so we need to take that money out of the general fund. We will take it from here. And that here might be the parks budget, it might be the city's contingency fund, it might be any number of funds um, that are located within the, the, the city's budget, or it might be borrowed from a different revenue source and then paid back over time. So it's, it's really kind of impossible to, to say other than the fact that yes, it, it does become a liability. Now with that said, there's a couple of things that, that also help protect the city. Um, Oregon has a couple of unique laws and one of those is a recreational immunity law. So if somebody gets hurt up there through you know, no fault of anybody else's, um, then it, it's not a liability. If they get hurt because of a facility up there and it's something that we don't know about, then we're protected also. However, if we know there's damage like on the trail um, where it uh, has some slide damage and some heaving, if they got hurt as a result of that, then we would have some liability there. In the event that uh, we would have some rock slides, if they hit a house, we would have a certain amount of liability with that also. Um, but most of that would be covered through the city's uh, insurance policies. Of course, that would ultimately bump up our rates at some point in time. So I know that was probably confusing and probably muddied the waters greatly. <laughs> That's my answer and I'm uh, gonna stick with it. But in the muddy waters, I'm going to add, and I can't get the right document up on my computer. Um, Waterboard Park is currently defined by the original charter vote, which I believe was in the 1970s, is a natural park. You can't add anything to it. You can't do anything to it. You can't make any improvements. What we now refer to as the upper yard that I've spent way too much time in court over is a actually a separate piece of property. And I know the city commission is moving toward declaring it a park. My suggestion would be we not declare it a charter park, that we declare it a park and we have additional work sessions over what can be done with that piece of the property. And yes, there were houses that were having boulders falling in their backyards and issues with the two bluffs. Um, it really takes more 
investigation and the city commission moving forward to bringing all of that property in as a charter park makes me really, really uncomfortable based on the history of the property. End of my comment. I got a hand raised. Doug? Obviously this is gonna be a discussion point coming up. But I would point out, we've got two charter parks that in our time have actually We've developed plans on, uh, well, we haven't in one of them, where I'm, I'm talking about a, a park that we just dedicated. Uh, we had bought that land and it was a charter park without doing anything on it for, the, for quite some time. That's true of a park that's close to us, that's I believe a charter park too, and nothing mm -hmm. has been done on. You could, you could declare something a charter park and not make a decision of how that park is used until you go through a process. Wesley owned, it took years before you, we actually came up with a plan for it, and years after that before we did anything. So actually declaring it as a, as a charter park does not say that we're gonna do anything to it for a period of time. And I will- bowlers. <laughs> That's true, but I will have to say if you declare everything from where the armory was to South Second Street or whatever that end of John Adams is as a charter park, you cannot do anything different with it. I think we may have some property that could be marketed to pay for improvements on the other portion of the property. And I honestly feel that if we recommend to the commission that the entire so-called upper yard, including the armory, or where the armory was, limits us because once it's declared a charter park, you can't do anything with it. Well, we've already made recommendations to the commission. I, we? Yes. No, we recommended the upper yard be yeah. added but that upper yard did not include the armory property. That's true. And Sean, your your input. Well, I was just gonna make two comments that that the 2020 PRAC has made no recommendation. I'm just overstating the obvious, but it doesn't mean we couldn't take another vote. And it turns out the same, it, it goes further in favor or further against. Um, I just don't see any reason for this to become a charter park and deal with the boundaries at this point. And the example of Wesley Lynn kind of doesn't work because Wesley Lynn wasn't designated a charter park till 20 years after it was purchased okay. and, and built. So when that's the case, it really, the track record would be perfect. Sure, we'll consider making this area of Waterboard Park a charter park once it's been upgraded and constructed. You know, that would be in keeping yeah. with the way we've done things in the past 10 or 12 years. Um, I, I, I just don't see any reason why, I mean, right now, if it's still city owned property, it's city owned property, it's still up to the commission, but kind of like Karen said, what if one of those corners, the developer came and said, you know, I'll pay you $900,000 for that corner of land that right now is a bunch of scrub brush and it meets the city's comp plan. And that $900,000 put with $100,000 of the city's budget fixes the entire trail system down through that park. To me, that's a win-win. So I, I just don't wanna tie anybody's um, hands up and, and say, it, it has to be this way. And, and that's my apprehension um, to, to trying to make this a charter park today or next month. I, got, I need to correct. I need to correct him. We voted uh, to renew that goal in 2020, at the beginning of 2020. There was discussion to remove it as a goal, and an individual vote was taken on it to keep it on. All right, Derek. Sure. Derek. Um, to add on to what Sean was saying, in a sense, I think. Uh, what happened as far as what PRAC voted on a few years ago, I think that we should revisit that 
because of the time frame. I also like what Don said. I think you have to look at the, the positive and negatives as far as uh, the reality of our economic situation right now and take a look at can we get, uh, can this area make um, money that we can take and then improve what we have existing already? Or is it going to be sitting there for the next 10 years producing nothing for what, you know, uh, for the future? I hate to give away land, but I also have to look at it practically. Do we want to improve what we have? Deferred maintenance is, you know, going years out. Do we want to overlook uh, a possible income source? Um, that's what I feel like on that. Um, I, just as a side note, I want to, uh, again, uh, welcome Kendall. As I said at the beginning of the meeting, I do have some prior commitments I got to take care of. I'm going to have to take off. I will finish watching the meeting at a later date. So I hope, um, sorry that I have to take off, but I've got to take off. Thank you, Derek. Okay, Brent and Alicia, you still have hands up. Are they on this topic or left over? Um, I just want to, oh, Go I ahead. just want to, oh, sorry. Okay, Alicia first. All right, <laughs> thank you. First. So I guess to Doug's comment in terms of kind of, to poorly summarize it, kind of no harm to put it as a charter park, I guess, um, going back to the whole concept. So let's say it was declared as a charter park now, um, then if there's vandalism or graffiti or partying or, you know, fires lit on the property or on the buildings before they removed, then would that be staff, like the maintenance park staff time going in there to manage that, um, whether it's covered, um, from the you know parks or not general fund is general fund it all it's all part of the same family um i guess that would be a big concern of mine because realistically that is an unsupervised property with really no eyes on it um you know eyes on the land um and very secluded and i know in years past um long time ago high schoolers used to go up there i don't know what the current <laughs> state of it is um but vandalism and graffiti don't is mention high schoolers up there we don't want them to know about it i know <laughs> but the reality, they know. <laughs> the reality of camping graffiti and vandalism not only is increasing in oregon city it's increasing everywhere in the portland metro area and it's not going to get better so that would be a big concern of mine Okay, Brent. Um, thanks, Karen. So a couple of things. I walked with Don and Troy and Sean up on the property a couple of weeks ago, and it was very interesting. Um, one of the questions I had was back when Don was talking about the law of a recreational facility. Don, was that a state or a city law? State law for a recreational immunity. As long as, okay. as, long as we're not charging a fee, we're protected. Okay. Um, it, to Alicia's point, it, it, it seems like there's more than just high schoolers up there. There's probably some hobo camps up there back off mm -hmm. um, the upper part as well. Um, I liked what Doug said about the charter park. I would like to see that property developed and done something with to help the community. And so that, that's all I have to say, Karen. Okay, so I think we're at, and I'd really like some kind of a, a vote because the city commission is moving forward. There is an option to transfer the property from public works to parks, period, or to move the property and approve it as a charter park, which basically means every square inch of it has to be used as a park and then we get into an interesting debate over whether it's part of a nature park which the existing water board park is uh, my personal preference which is pushing things but <laughs> the upper yard could be adopted as property to be transferred to the parks department for future development, not as a charter park, which creates some of the limitations. But up to anybody who makes the first motion. 
Well, I'm, I'm going to suggest something first. First of all, I don't think I have any problem with that. But this is not an action item on our agenda. If we're going to do that, I think that should be put into the next uh, meeting. I can't hear you, Doug. Yeah, Doug, the problem is this is moving ahead quickly with the city commission. I, I'm sorry. I don't, think we can, I don't think we can take an action on an item that is not on the agenda. I, Doug, I can't hear what you're saying. Okay, I don't totally disagree with Doug. Um, Don? Karen, I believe you need to restate what Doug was saying, saying for Troy and others who may not have yeah, heard. Yeah, I can't hear. Doug. Doug's too okay. quiet or the microphone or something. All right, so the issue is Water Board Park is not a specific action item on our agenda right now. Um, it is an issue that is moving ahead on the City Commission agenda. We can make a motion or we can stay silent until next month and put it on as a specific agenda item. Karen, this is Brent, I have my hand up. Regarding this subject, can we have like an, a, an emergency meeting or something before the city commissioner to our city commission meeting to have this, this item put on an agenda and vote on it specifically? We can Kendall. we can have a motion right now to add it to tonight's agenda if we think we've discussed it enough. Uh, if we need a discussion, yes. we can have a meeting. But if we don't need a discussion, I know we can have a motion. City commission. Now, you know, people, Kendall, sticky wicket. <laughs> can we put this up as a special meeting in a week or two weeks? Yes. Okay. I will accept that because we really need to get our voice in on this topic. The city commission is moving ahead and has not asked us for any input. So um, I don't know how you give me a nod. Everybody unmute, say yes or no to let Kendall get this on a special agenda in <coughs> two weeks. Which, which part? Are we putting the whole thing or just so which part are we putting? The whole thing. The whole thing. Okay. Yep. Kendall, the whole that's thing you. Find is Waterboard Park, correct? Yeah. And it's Waterboard Park, or it's two parts. Okay. Because the Both upper parts. yard, the upper park, is already a natural park. Mm -hmm. Kendall, good with yeah. you. Yes. Okay. Everyone else, no one, anyone disagreeing? No. 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 I don't disagree, but I have my hand up for a question. Okay, Sean. Uh, Kendall, you mentioned earlier that Tony had talked to you about this topic and would provide information to you for our next scheduled PRAC meeting. That led me to believe that there would be no city action on this topic until after that time. Did you get the same feeling? No, I, I, I didn't get that same feeling. Um, and it was uh, in a one on one meeting with Tony. So I can follow up with him uh, and get that information. And I'd be happy to share that with, with all of you. Great. Because my concern would be we could push this off to next month's PRAC meeting if the city commission is going to stand by and allow us to do our job. If they're going to rush this, then I agree with us calling a special meeting to provide that necessary input. And, and the, the information that, that Tony was sharing with me was just to provide some additional context to the process and the steps that they're taking and where they are in that process. Okay, thank you. Okay, and, and sorry, Kendall, welcome to Oregon City. <laughs> I've been watching the meetings and yes, they're moving ahead without any question about input from PRAC. Okay, are we good? Good. Okay, uh, consent agenda. For those of you who came in late, minutes number one through five on the original approval of minutes were moved to a consent agenda. I will you have to approve the consent agenda. Thank you. Second? 
I'm sorry. Second, who moved? Who moved? Um, okay, second? Second. Okay, Sean moved, and who seconded? <laughs> Give me a name for the minutes. Doug and Andy. Doug. Okay, Doug wins. Because uh, this is the problem with those five sets of minutes. Okay, all those in favor of approving the consent agenda, please say aye. 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 All right, Don, the consent agenda is approved. Five sets of minutes have now been added to our historic record. Thank you. Okay, any member? Katie will be thrilled. <laughs> and our our library staff will be thrilled that they worked so hard coming up with who did what. <laughs> All right, any member reports? I've got a comment. Yes. Can everybody hear me? Yes. Good. Yes. I disagree, enough, I, disagree, yes with, I disagree with Sean's statement about our our advisory board being uh, one of the few in which there weren't political divisions. I don't think any of the advisory boards have that issue. You do have that issue on the governing boards, like the city commission, the urban renewal agency, and occasionally the planning commission. It's by their nature. That's where the decisions are made. I don't know. I don't remember any any of the advisory committees I've been on having political divisions. They may have disagreements, but I don't remember any political divisions. I think you're absolutely right, Doug. <laughs> <laughs> okay, Brett, do you still have your hand up for something old or something new? Something new, Karen. Yes, I just Brett. I just wanted to say that the Park Place uh, new playground equipment has been completely installed. Fortunately for COVID-19, no kids are playing on it, but it is installed and it looks really good. Fantastic. Sean? I just wanted to mention that last night I attended the first uh, 2040 comp plan review meeting and um, uh, the concerns that they have uh, I wanted to bring up to this group because you're all advocates for the city and the concern is trying to get the information out. They have the uh, survey right now that they're trying to get people to fill out online. It's on the city's uh, uh, social media pages and they've been emailing it. I'm sure you've seen it. Uh, advocates, they're asking for us to send those to our friends and neighbors and help get the word out. So I thought I would put that out here as I'm the PRAC representative on that group. Uh, and then the second topic is I just wanted to mention to staff that uh, uh, the um, McLaughlin Promenade parking lot uh, maintenance work looks outstanding. That's been a place that um, mm -hmm. has uh, looked deficient for a long time. And I that some city dollars were put into that parking lot in the last week or so, and I appreciate it. Okay, Troy? I, um, back on July 17th, I was privileged to actually attend an in-person Oregon City community event. Oh, thank you. We're actually having some of those. So it was the um, Preserve Our Past Art and Poetry Contest at the Ermatinger House. So I was able to go to that. It was um, a contest that was done for, well, I guess it was the children that were at various ages, and it was out on the lawn at the Ermatinger house. Um, and they broke it up into groups. Normally they were gonna do a banquet, you know, in a big room, but <clears throat> they broke it up into groups of each uh, age group that had done the poetry so that they weren't all in the same room at the same time. And so it was a small group of, I think, 10, 12, 15 of us outside in the lawn and they did it over, I think there were four different groups. So, or maybe it was three different groups. I can't remember, four, actually it's four groups. Um, and it was good. So they gave them presentations. The, um, oh my gosh, I was gonna say it and then they just slipped my mind. Oh, the Optimist Club donated, um, they, they awarded, so there was a money award for each winner and they awarded that to the kids, um, the winners of the poetry and then it's gonna be for about the next year to 12 to 18 months, it's, they're gonna have their poetry and their art displayed around the city. 
for the winners. So it was kind of a nice little event. They had snacks and water. And like I say, outside event, everybody was masked up, kept your distance and outdoors. So that was kind of cool. Okay, and I have to say a huge thank you to Troy for doing that. I can't hear you. Um, oh, oh. You're not muted, I just can't hear no? you. No, I'm not muted, okay. No, nope, you're not muted. There we go. Uh, thank you to Troy for being willing to do that. Sean was not available and this old lady is still not really comfortable with, bullet, with uh, public exposure. Uh, this is a wonderful program that I actually helped start several years ago. Um, May is Historic Preservation Month. And the kids in this community came up with incredible art. So thank you, Troy, for doing that. Yeah, I, I mentioned that was both poetry and uh, painted, drawn artwork, two different categories. Yep. <laughs> All right, so now we are down to staff reports. Who has what? <laughs> and Don, you have become our consigliere emeritus. So whichever one of you has something to say. <laughs> well, I, I uh, actually, I will defer uh, to Denise and let her talk briefly. Um, if Denise, are you still there? Ah, she was. I am. I just oh, there you go. Hey, Denise, would you mind talking briefly about uh, what's going on out at uh, Tyrone's Woods and um, over at uh, DC Lauderdale? Sure. So Tyrone S. Woods, um, probably the, the biggest thing we probably want to share with you is that the timeline has extended to mid-February. And that's due to some of the engineering and road items that we have to um, put in um, as a requirement. So some of those requirements have extended our timeline a bit. We're in the process of doing cut, cut and fill and grading. Uh, obviously, during our cut and fill process, if you've been watching the Myers Road project, there's uh, an excess of boulders. So we have hit that uh, pocket or two or three or three of boulders, and so we have an excess of boulders on site. Uh, those we are burying in some of our areas, they are part of our cut and fill balance. So with some of that, we can use them as part of our balance and some of the low, low spots, we can put the boulders in and we'll achieve enough topsoil um, to still do what we want to do on, on the surfaces. Uh, some of the boulders will move to Lauderette, which we're doing a boulder wall. And, uh, obtain a, a, a little bit of a cost savings in using our own rocks. Um, for that um, At Tyrone S. Woods, the VFW has secured and ordered a memorial monument. We also ordered the flagpole, it's a 25 foot flagpole. So those will all culminate into the project. Um, those are a donation from the VFW through fundraising efforts. Um, on their behalf, and we'll get the, um, the monument and memorial area. With Lauderette, uh, DC Lauderette's contract was awarded earlier this month um, by the City Commission. We're do we've done our due diligence with the paperwork portion. Uh, we've got all our um, performance and payment bonds in. So our next step is doing a pre-construction meeting on site. We'll be doing that on next Tuesday with Paul Brothers. Let's see, um, after we do the on-site meeting with them, then we'll do a notice to proceed. We've given an update to the, um, 
the Girl Scout troop area. Sorry, I'm blank blanking on the name that they're using now. The core the team. Lot of Red Army. The DC Letter Army Corps team. So they have been given updates along the way. Um, they still want to participate in the actual construction of the project. Uh, I think we're going to try and have to do a little bit of logistics because that in this COVID time makes things a little bit, um, a little bit difficult, but not un untenable. We, I think we can still achieve it. Uh, we just got to find a project that we can get the social distancing, keep the heavy equipment apart from the girls and um, those that want to participate. So we'll be talking about that uh, in our scheduling meeting in logistics and what they can, what we can kind of parcel out for them to partake in. They are very active and they want to remain active. And so we want to give them a way to facilitate getting their hands in, into the dirt, so to speak. Um, other than that, we're just kind of trudging along, trying to get through all of the submittals and questions for uh, Tyrone S. Woods. And so far, so good. I think we're moving along pretty well. Thank you, Denise. Welcome. That's uh, all I have. I, I would I defer back to our director, Kendall. Well, I am uh, just taking some time to learn from Don. Uh, Don has been very helpful in, in helping me get up to speed, uh, reaching out to my staff, uh, getting ready to set up some some one on ones with them, so so I can get to know them better uh, and figure out how I can provide the support necessary. Uh, so just trying to develop some routines, lots of paperwork, uh, lots of stuff to to learn. Uh, but um, hitting the ground running. And uh, this will be probably the shortest staff report we'll ever receive from me moving forward. <laughs> Thank you, Kendall. Okay, Don, <clears throat> oh, excuse me. Don, Kendall, chime in whichever one of you chimes in on the future agenda stuff. Yes. Um, oh, good, I'm on. Uh, I, I reviewed uh, the, the idea of the future agenda uh, with Kendall. i uh, talked to him about uh, how we wanted to make sure that we are not uh, losing anything in the shuffle and that that was the intention of it. Uh, you'll see some dates there. Those are the dates that we have discussed those particular topics, uh, but we also have the ability to assign dates for future discussion of those topics. And, I th and we can also add items to that list um, so that we're not losing anything. We're not having anything drop off the table, so to speak. And uh, that was kind of the intent to it. I think that uh, at some point you guys want to have that conversation, maybe at your next meeting and have that conversation and start assigning um, specific dates to some of those specific topics so that uh, we don't lose sight of all those items that are very important to get done. Okay, so Don, thank you so much. I'm now going to refer to you as consultant emeritus. We have done a great deal in the last couple of months with your help. Thank you so much. I am so looking forward to working with Kendall. And Kendall hopefully gets to keep you. Yeah, everybody unmute and clap for Don. It, uh, it's been a pleasure. <laughs> And, and I, will, uh, I will always answer Kendall's phone calls and I'll be in the office again tomorrow and I will uh, come back as often as he, uh, as he can stand having me around. Only Kendall's phone calls? Is that what that meant? Was that? There's, Only there's Kendall's free... phone calls? Is that what that meant? Yes. <laughs> no, there's, there's free coffee at City Hall, so it's always nice for me to hang out there too. Yes, but okay, and everybody else might chuckle when I realized we had hired Kendall Reed, R-E-I-D, yes, Kelly already had that email address, K-R-E-I-D at orcity.org. Please make sure you have looked at Kendall's business card. He is now Kendall 
R-E-I-D at ORCity.org because he somehow did not become K. Reed too. <laughs> <laughs> we love our Kelly, but Kendall gets his very own name and phone number and he did attach those to one of his emails. Anybody else? <laughs> Seeing nobody? We're done. Thanks to Donna. Thank you so much, everybody. Donna, I hope this means you're retiring. Yeah, it's, it's been a blast, and I got all kinds of projects. My honey-do list is growing every day. Yes. So, Don, is your next temporary assignment down in Eugene? Is that what I hear? Yeah, well, I would love to do that. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, who knows? If something comes along, we'll take a look at it. Don, I look forward to seeing you at the... Uh, at the ribbon cutting at Tyrone Woods Park. Couldn't give yes. me away. Same with the DC Lotterette. Yep. Don, thank you for the transition and the improvements. And Kendall's so looking forward to working with you. <laughs> yes. Looking forward to meeting you. Oh, I'm going to call it a night. So good night, folks. Night, all. Thank you, everybody. You bet. <laughs>